Welcome today to our episode of Shifted Ed Podcast. Today we have uh, the legendary Gary Steger with us uh, to talk about all things life, really. Um, thanks for uh, joining uh, me today, Gary. How how are you doing? Good. It's a gloomy day here in Los Angeles, but um, happy to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you. Are you did you get some uh, tennis practice in before? Uh, later the later i played i played mean i played a mean girls tonight <laughs> nice what got you into playing tennis anyway like what it what is it about the game that you're just like I've, I've i've seen that you've been doing a lot of practices you got a lot of training what is it about tennis that um clicks with you um ironically i had a crazy middle school band director who ran an after school tennis activity when I was in the sixth grade um and so I did that and I was never athletic in fact I, I kind of marvel at my ability to do anything on a tennis court now because I literally had special gym as a kid um <laughs> now it has a fancy title like adaptive PE or something but um I literally got got pulled out of class for extra gym um because I was mm. so uncoordinated and um when the pandemic you know I, I always liked tennis and I always thought it was a good way to get exercise but I didn't play it and I belonged to a tennis club that I used for the gym which I never went to um and never never paid up for tennis because I was traveling too much and then the pandemic fixed that right and right around the right around the time of the pandemic um I had a orthopedic doctor who I'd been seeing for my terminally bad legs and and some lower back pain and he said get some cardio so I go okay I'll I'll start playing tennis and um it, it's been it's been interesting it's been interesting to watch you know I, I've taken lessons with a lot of different people and it's been an opportunity to see good instruction and bad instruction the <laughs> the um this sort of the exercise in making friends with normal people has been interesting <laughs> although I, I uh, although I believe I, I achieved peak popularity during the global deadly once in a century pandemic um i i seem to be considerably less considerably less attractive now um but um and then i started losing some weight and then i became kind of obsessive about, about that so it's it's all yeah. been good that's great that's a great cool journey cool journey <laughs> yeah the pandemic uh, shifted a lot of things um indeed before we we jump into that gary i just i've always wanted to ask you some of your earliest memories of doing what you do now, like where do you think it started? Where do you think your um, your passion for teaching and and always pushing that innovation button further, further? Like where did you first start to 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 feel like this was going to be something I would do for a long time? Um, there's definitely a through line, but the question i have to come at the, the answering that question from a couple of different angles um one was i'm a i'm a product of public school education in in new jersey about 25 miles west of new york city um and my public school education was as was as terrible and as great as anyone's um you know when i read about bully you know the epidemic of bullying and the, the stuff that i went through as a kid who weighed 58 pounds in eighth grade and had a big mouth um, it's kind of the stuff of movies or criminal indictments today. Um, having said that, there were always teachers that I hung out with. Um, there was always some teacher that I had a relationship with, even some of the ones who were kind of abusive. Um, and and some and some of them, not the abusive ones, I'm still in, in contact with today. So that's that's a that's one answer. This the second answer, more specifically about the work that I do, is. Um, the things that bring me the most beauty and joy and meaning and purpose in my life were are things that I was introduced to in a public middle school classroom. I fell in love with composing music and play playing music and learned about jazz and learned how to program computers around the seventh grade at Scar Colfax Junior High School in Wayne, New Jersey. Um, and part of part of my passion is is rooted in a desire to ensure that. Um, future kids and my grandkids um, aren't denied of similar high quality experiences. 
Um, in, in, the, in the seventh grade, I had Mr. Jones for a computer programming class. I'm not sure what it was called. It was between baking a, tie, baking a souffle and making a tie rack. Um, <laughs> it was in that sort of, you know, make the kids do something for nine weeks kind of approach to middle school. And um, that was in 1975. The school hmm. district where I the school district where I grew up got a timeshare system in terminals, I believe, in '62 or '64. It's kind of extraordinary. So by '75, yeah. there was an expectation that every kid would spend nine weeks in middle school learning how to program computers. And for oh. the first time in my life, in Mr. Jones's class, I felt smart. I felt capable and creative and competent because we didn't know what was impossible. We thought anything was possible. We pulled each other up by our bootstraps. We challenged one another. And there was a several year period during which we hadn't seen software that wasn't written by someone we knew directly. Hmm. Um, I mean, I remember when we saw the first commercial software, it was kind of like a God's must be crazy moment. Um, right. What is this amazing thing? And, um, and then I spent the rest of junior high and high school kind of signing up for as much elective computing time as possible. Um, hmm. And spent a lot, an awful lot of time programming, programming during those years. And then graduated high school in 1981 thinking, well, that computer stuff was a fun distraction, but no one will ever have a computer. That's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, six months later, I had a job teaching kids programming. And within a year, I was teaching teachers. And I've been kind of doing the same thing ever since. And my, my instincts about using a computer as an intellectual laboratory and vehicle for self-expression, a way of making things, um, and the power of debugging and how that matches young person's remarkable capacity for intensity has, has kind of remained consistent through a lot of the work that I've done. Right. What, what's the cross section there between programming and music? Like, where do they meet? Um, Cause you were mentioning that, you, you know, you started off with a passion of music and then programming was like, is there a cross section? Do they connect? I mean, undoubtedly, and lots of people have done done work in this area um, that could speak speak to the specifics. I'll, I'll only talk about it from my perspective. I, mm -hmm. I I think I think it matches, like I said, the young people's remarkable capacity for intensity. It's it's something you can really throw yourself into and look at from a variety of perspectives and get lost in, and you're making something out of nothing. And just elemental blocks and um and that that has an increasing degree of difficulty the better you get at it um and kind of doesn't disappoint you and one one of the things that makes me sad that so many kids are deprived of these experiences is that how the the sort of power and joy that comes from being lost in a problem that's bigger than yourself but that you have a sense that you have a sense you can make sense of and, and come out the other end better for it. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, and the reason, you know, I, I went off to, to, to pursue a career in being a jazz musician. I, I, I had a scholarship to Berkeley college of music and, and I, I pursued that until my conspicuous lack of talent caught up with me. And um, so, I mean, I, so I, I, I don't think it's, uh, how do I say this? I think programming is more is more um, democratized than being an artist. It, it's not clear to me that everyone could be a great artist. In fact, I'm positive that that's not the case. And I'm yeah. often finding myself in context where I have to say to people, you know, well, obviously you've never been around anyone who's gr great at something. Um, right. But but I think I think lots of people can be really good programmers, and I think. Programming is a way of making sense of the world and having agency over an increasingly um, complex and technologically sophisticated era. Absolutely. Well, I do share your your um, envy of great musicians. Um, I've encountered many where they can pick a tune up from a second of listening to something and can play right along to it. And it's uh, I always marveled at people that have that capacity to just internalize something so quickly and then just throw it back out at you so it's, <laughs> it's yeah I, I, i'm i'm astonished by the arrogance that i once possessed that, of thinking that i could do this thing um i've got friends who are among the you know i've been blessed to have friends who are among the greatest jazz musicians in history and um mm. the 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 infinite complexity of what they do is a miracle and 
well beyond my pay grade. And the best I yeah. can do now is share their stories and pay to go hear them perform and publish <laughs> books by some of them and, and such things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, but, but, but again, it, it's, it's, I, I often say that schools have an obligation to introduce children to things they don't yet know they love. Great. That that's our primary right. responsibility as educators. And I fell in love with stuff that really has served me well through my life that I wouldn't have discovered on my own or on television. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was at a, I was at an event a week ago where someone was talking about designing a school where they had a media wing and it was media because art and music and drama are part of media. And, <laughs> and, and I was, no, 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 no. That's media is just commerce. Become good at something and, and the commerce will take care of itself. There's, there's a vulgarity to that. And I, there, there's a Quincy Jones quote that I won't get exactly right, but he says something like, um, when you're thinking about money, God leaves the room. And, you know, so, so, you know, yeah. and this connects to computer, to computing and, and computer programming. Um, you know, lots sure. of schools are interested in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And then For it's sure, about, yeah. you know, making a pitch and, and printing a brochure, but how about having a skill that's sellable? And, mm. you know, how about teaching kids to like, you know, place Facebook ads or build WordPress sites or write computer programs um, and make them and have them create a Fiverr account and actually produce <laughs> some revenue and, and a service that's of value and develop skills that, that, that can serve them, whether as a side hustle or as, as, as a future career path. Um, Absolutely. You know, the entrepreneurship will take care of itself. I, I'm, I'm routinely desperate for, you know, high school kids who can actually edit a video or write right, a little bit right. of code or, you know, figure out, like I said, figure out online advertising systems. Um, and it, it just, we always, we always want to fetishize the, the tri the most trivial notion of the trivial part of, of an, of a pursuit. And, and that's mm -hmm. often, you know, focusing on the making a buck, Great. even if the, and, and, and implicit in the making a buck is everyone's a genius. You don't actually have to be good at anything or know anything. You just have to know the mm -hmm. game. Right. Right. It's funny though, how, cause I agree with you. And I see this in the schools and the environments that I work with where it's not about looking to the future almost and, and, and imagining the possibilities that are going to be out there and how do we get our kids prepared for that? It's really still this fixation on the immediacy of, you know, the next assignment, the next test, the next, you know, whatever it is that we're having them produce and jump through the hoops with. Um, like, and I know that you've, 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 this has been something in your forefront for a long time, but where does the shift start to happen where we start giving back to the kids, where we start saying, you know, can we focus more on what their future is going to be like rather than what's happening right now or which happened, you know, a hundred years ago? I think the best way to serve the kids is to focus on what's right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 look, I don't have a crystal ball about what the future is going to hold, but like I said, this, the skills and things I fell in love with in junior high have served me pretty well. And, Great. um, the habits of mind that I developed and, um, I, I don't need to be worrying about what, which programming language kids are going to be using in the future. That's just a way of distracting us from teaching them how to program now. Um, right. so, right. so I, I'm actually, I, I think the immediacy of now is not a bad thing. I think, you know, if you want to study entrepreneurs, they've all got a story about how at 12 years old, they did something that made them a couple bucks and, mm. and that led them on a path to, to, you know, to Shark Tank or to, you know, Richard Branson or Mark Cuban, or, you know, you know, pick, pick anyone who's sort of captured the, pu the public's imagination about you know, becoming a billionaire. Um, they almost always have some story of something they did as a teenager that, that lit a fire in them that, that showed them how to, their capacity as learners, their ability to adapt, um, to communicate, to collaborate, to create. Um, I'm not the least, you know, I, I've done a keynote on a number of occasions called frankly, I'm bored with the future. Um, mm. we're, 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 we're always jumping to the, yeah, but, um, mm. you know, and, and I know, you know, everyone wants to talk about AI this, these days and the, the very same people who are 
obnoxiously putting AI and education expert in their LinkedIn profiles are the very same people who have been fighting me for 40 years when I say that every kid should learn how to program. Right. Because right. they want to talk about stuff. They don't want to know how to do anything. And, right. and one, of the, one of the most powerful experiences I had with my mentor and friend and colleague Seymour Papert was when he asked us, what were we thinking about doing with some kids next? And when we, when we answered, he replied, and what can they do with that? Hmm. Um, so, hmm. you, know, hmm. you know, it's funny, too, because there may be an opportunity here for some, for some um, finding common ground with people who we don't agree with um, politically hmm. or ideologically. I know, for example, hmm. you know, Newt Gingrich, who's kind of a repugnant human being and former Speaker of the House in the United States. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, he, he used to talk a lot about, you know, what it feels like to a poor kid to be handed five bucks for something that they did mm. and had a, had a kind of life changing. And, and literally, the, there's the stuff that we could be teaching kids in a, in, in a computing class uh, could be something that people around the world are paying them for because the internet makes it possible to, to you know, set up a little business and do that. Um, but instead, I'm finding, you know, 15 year old kids who can't take a photo with an iPhone and, mm. and, a, and a, you know, generation of, of people who still don't know how to find their file or copy and paste. For sure. For sure. Right. It's Let just alone. coming to fallacy a little bit, right. Of this, these digital natives that we're producing where like, I have a hard time seeing that as, as you, as you mentioned, <laughs> to just do the simplest of tasks um, and just having yeah, so, this in a, so yeah, yeah, so kids, so kids, you can sort of punch in the face and go, <laughs> you know, yeah, some digital native, you can't even use an iPhone. <laughs> and <Right. laughs> um, if you say to teachers, how come you've had a laptop for 30 years and you don't know how to use your trackpad, then you get into trouble. <laughs> Um, but the kids could take the punch and someone ought to be calling them out on it. We need to raise our expectations. Mm -hmm. We need, we, you know, the helplessness is unattractive at best and right. unproductive. Right. And, and it's our fault. It's our fault. The standards are way too low. And, and when I say standards, I mean it in the literal and figurative sense. Because if you look at the standards that are passed out, you know, the 5,000 page you know, colorful brochures with the meaningless tables of vocabulary that kids are supposed to, that doesn't lead to any, any kind of understanding or functionality or fluency. Um, right. But we also ought to have the standard that kids can actually do things. You know, why, why do we live right. in a time where we actually can talk about computer science unplugged or hour of code? Have we somehow run out of computers? Have we somehow run out of hours? <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Why, no, why should so these so bizarre? Why should these be, be acceptable norms that we just sort of nod our heads to? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right? Right, right, right. And where, so where the you... thing, so, so, just one more thing. So the thing I often yeah. think about, you know, this Mr. Jones's class in seventh grade, um, you know, first of all, he was a remarkable educator. He, he had to have been. He had one or two teletypes in his classroom and 25 or 30 kids, and he kept us engaged. Um, but hmm. it seems to me that, it's maybe not such a bad idea to have a nine week period somewhere in kids education where every kid has a programming experience. Um, and maybe now we need to do it in third or fourth grade so that they can develop some mm. fluency and some agency over the system. And then, you know, by the time they get to adolescence, some kids will choose computer science as their project. Um, but, it, you know, we make, we make a billion decisions about some arbitrary nonsense that all kids should learn. It seems to me right. that we, we could come together and say, hey, look, we could really spend a few months making sure kids can can make the computer dance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think, too, a lot of like teachers hesitation, too, is they're not there. This feeling of not feeling like an expert or like, you know, what if they run into a problem? And I mean, what am I going to do if if I don't have an answer for it? Um, and I think that that mindset is, is slowly shifting over time, but still has a, um, still kind of has its hooks in, in a lot of educators. What, what are your, when you're going in and, and working with teachers and students, what is the one thing that you try to leave behind for them to think about or to keep pushing forward? Like, what, what do you hope that they that your experience ends with, uh, or their thoughts that they keep about their time with you? 
I try to create models and I want to leave them with the idea that things need not be as they seem. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, to, to your earlier point about, you know, not being an expert in everything, that's, that's, that's a trope that kind of takes my breath away. You know, who told you you were? Where, where in your education were you told you knew everything? It's, it's preposterous. Um, what, I, what I think might be different today, frankly, from when I got involved in educational computing in the early 80s was um, what we were doing with computers and programming in the early and mid 80s was deeply rooted in progressive traditions and, and radical views of, of democracy, of the women's movement, the anti-war movement, of civil rights. Um, mm-hmm. and there was a literature around this. I mean, I've got a hundred, at least logo books. Some are great, some are terrible, but there was a literature mm-hmm. about how to teach computing to children. And, and logo came out of not only the artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT, but it came out of Piaget and it came out of Herb Cole and Ivan Illich and, and, um, you know, f- folks, who, uh, Loris Malaguzzi and, and John Dewey, and it was explicitly about a different kind of educational experience and diet for children. And, mm-hmm. and so as we've sort of torn off pieces of this and all we're left with is gadgets and stuff to buy and um, things to do to generate a press release, um, it becomes harder for teachers to, to support and to buy into. So, I mean, I mean you've, been, you've been constructing modern knowledge. We, we sort of take, all, we, we take an approach mm-hmm. at, the, at the whole, that the environment is different by design. The, the expectations are different. We, there's conversations with smart people. We're, we have, you know, there's, there's sufficient time and a supportive culture and a range of expertise. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, it's, and it's rooted in, it's rooted in powerful ideas that are, that are bigger than ourselves. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, when I, when I work in a school, I try to create as many models as possible because um, I don't get the, the opportunity that I used to have. I mean, when I worked in the first laptop schools 33 years ago, um, I, I got to spend as much as three months in a school at a time, you know, being able to wander into classrooms and saying, hey, that's interesting. Why don't you try this? Or, hey, stop doing that. Why don't you do it this way? Um, and could take teachers away and run workshops and talk to the principal and speak with parents and work with kids, uh, you know, and now I get, you know, a, a day at a school or so, so it's it, the, the experience is different. So I try to create as many different kinds of models as possible. So that after I mm-hmm. leave, the teachers have something to think about and to share with one another and that that'll inspire them to, to, uh, to continue to learn and grow on their own. Absolutely. Well, I was really fortunate to be one of those schools that you worked with on those early deployment years. I mean, um, back at Eastern townships, when you, um, came and did some workshops with us. And, but I will tell you that CMK constructing modern knowledge is a ground changer for, for my trajectory anyway. And I think a lot of people that I kept in touch with that had gone to CMK, that it's, that it's like you said, Gary, it's like you walk in and it's like different and you feel like everything is possible. Um, you're scared as heck, but you're so supported with everybody that's there and the, and the faculty and um, that you're the fear kind of washes away. Um, tell me what was the nucleus behind CMK? Well, like, I was there the second year of it. So I'm, I wasn't there the first year, but the second year we were still in the small room upstairs uh, uh, in New Hampshire. Oh, you should see it now. <laughs> yeah, well, I went actually a few years later uh, when yeah. you had the huge area, and I just it was just amazing. Um, but where did it come from? Like, where did that? Where did the idea hatch itself? Um, it, there are two sources. One was um, two great educators um, from New England, Dan and Molly Watt, who were who were giants in education during the mid eighties. Um, Dan wrote the, one of the, probably the, the first educational computing book that sold over 100,000 copies, um, Learning with Logo. And Molly, and he had been part of the MIT Logo group in the 70s. And um, Molly was a progressive educator with roots in the civil rights movement, women's movement. Um, who, who, and the two of them ran, when I started to go, three-week-long Logo Institutes in rural New Hampshire. 
Um, and that was at a time where teachers would come to a workshop for three weeks. They'd leave their families and it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. And I went as a participant and, um, and everything I know about teaching teachers, I learned from Dan and Molly. And actually they're going to be back, um, at CMK this, this July 11th to 14th, because I, I, I'm feeling a real obligation to, um, document what, what the giants whose shoulders I stand on, um, represented Great. and um and so they're going to be part of a legends panel with cynthia solomon the mother of educational computing the other force the real the other impetus for cmk um was um seymour papert and i used to have a lot of conversations where we would you know be at a conference or we pick up a magazine article and read how one of our heroes in, in progressive education had said another stupid thing about computers and modernity hmm. about you know you know, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater or, you know, kids shouldn't have computers when they should be doing X. And, and, and I used to say to Seymour who had potentially infinite resources, not always the ability or willingness or interest in execution. Um, Seymour, can we get these people in a room and have a conversation with them and show them what we're talking about and show them how, what we're doing is wholly consistent with their life's work. And yet we're, we're, we're connecting kids to modernity in a, in a way that's, that's beautiful and humane and, and soul amplifying. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we had a lot of those discussions and Seymour never pulled the trigger or created the thing. And I just decided, okay, mm -hmm. if no one else is going to do it, I will. And so mm -hmm. we, you know, we've, we've run 14 CMKs and kind of an abbreviated version that was, that was in the middle of the pandemic, um, all on the smell of an oily rag, all on just people showing up, um, no sponsors, mm -hmm. no exhibit hall, We've had right. ridiculous speakers who have been world changers and not only just in thinking and education and technological pioneers, but um, folks who are the best at what they do in careers that their guidance counselors never imagined existed. Um, uh, we've had, I think, four MacArthur geniuses and mm -hmm. a bunch of Grammy winners <laughs> and, um, you know, Nicole mm -hmm. Hannah-Jones before she was, you know, the number one right. band person in America. Um <laughs> And Jonathan Kozel, and you know a lot of my heroes, and um, mm -hmm. and and so so CMK came out of that experience of creating this idyllic environment where people could construct knowledge, where they could fall in love with le learning again, they could reacquaint themselves with their own power as a learner, to recognize that things need not be as they seem, and to spend time in the presence of people who are great at what they do, um, whether that's another teacher they never met before or or the, the speakers that that we've been able to wrangle and and it's and it's the whole process is is built on reciprocity of hmm. you know there's a lot of rhetoric about teachers as learners which you know is often little more than rhetoric um hmm. but we learn a lot from our participants we've everything from you know throughout the year i buy things that look interesting that might be useful and then we put it out on a table and sometimes we don't even know which table to put it on because we don't even know what the thing does <laughs> and and some teacher figures out what it does and does something remarkable with it so there's there's that kind of reciprocity where we learn from the participants um but but it's also been really um important to me and rewarding that Alfie Cohn and Deborah Meyer and, and folks like that, Lillian Kath and Leila Gandini and Carlo Rinaldi have come to mm -hmm. CMK as remarkable learner-centered educators who have forgotten more about learning than I'll ever know. And they look around and go, okay, I get it. And, mm -hmm. and then their rhetoric and practice changes based on seeing what teachers are capable of. And when 85-year-old jazz legends see what what teachers can do they kind of it takes their breath away and when i run into them at the village vanguard they want to tell other musicians about this amazing thing they were at this, this amazing event mm -hmm. um so um that's been important to me too i mean you know when alfie Cohn called and said you know why should i be on twitter or i just took my kids to a scratch workshop that that was a lot and you know deborah meyer responds to each piece of our email about the upcoming Institute saying, Oh, I wish I could come. Um, right. and that's, that's, that's really rewarding for me as well. Yeah. I think too, that it's passed down. Like now, Gary, like you said, you stand on the shoulders of giants, but I feel like you, I stand on your shoulders, you know, like it, 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 
feeds its way down through as the generations kind of roll through. Um, I remember knowing that it leaving there, I felt like I was something bigger, you know, a bigger community, a bigger um, a sense of what I could do and where I could go um, that I didn't have before that. And I mean, it's a three day experience, but I think that it, like I could speak truly having attended a couple of times that it, it changes your tra trajectory of your career. It did mine anyway. Um, so well, I thank, well, thank you for you. that. It's well, just well, really, thank you for that. I mean, it means a lot. I mean, we, it's a really big rock to push up the hill every year and people it always is. ask, you know, are we going to do it again? And, and the answer is always, I uh, don't know. Um, okay. I do it because it has to exist, but it's hard. It's hard to keep it going. And I mean, it's physically hard. It's every part of it yeah. is hard. The risk is the hard. The, yeah. the schlepping, the, the, when, when, the, when it's over and we come home and then a week later, the truck pulls up with it in boxes and I have to put it away again. It's hard. Um, right. And, right. um, you know, one of the, th you know, another connection, one of the things I love so much about jazz musicians is, is the hang and the reverence for, for continuum hmm. that you're, you're supposed to be leaving the campsite better than you found it. You're supposed to be building upon something that came before you. Um, you know, I've been doing a, a talk, I'm working on a book called the case against innovation. And I, and I say, you know, like genius or supermodel, you don't get to call yourself an innovator. Um, that's, that's for like history to determine. Um, that's for other people to judge, you know, and, yeah. and, and the people who call themselves innovators, you can bet they can't point to an actual innovation. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you could see a lineage through, through the jazz musicians that I, that I love. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of the, the stories that I hear like yours that really move me, you know, and the, the folks who tell me, Oh yeah, that's, you know, that there was that time I went for soup dumplings with Carlo Rinaldi, the, the grand dame of Reggio Emilia, or, you know, went for a walk with, with Edith Ackerman, who we sadly lost a couple of years ago, or, I mean, um, or I took a new job because of this, or someone tweeted, I'd quit teaching and I'm going back because, because of the experience. And so I think about Absolutely. the discussions about teacher retention and the current crisis we're in. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel an obligation and to, to keep going. And I think that find that that's, you know, that's, that's, it's, that's the greatest reward of, of, of running this like insane event that we do every year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and just, and just, you know, the, you know, the, the folks, the small team of faculty who donate their time and who've gotten to the point where, you know, I can raise an eyebrow or point in a direction of a corner of the room and they know exactly what to do and right. how little information to dispense to ensure that, you know, I always say less us, more them, so that the learner can have the richest experience possible. When, Absolutely. you know, you, you, would, you would know. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've worked with other people who um, just can't shut up, kind of like me mm -hmm. now, but, um, you know, and, <laughs> uh, and who, who are terrible in teaching in that kind of environment. Um, I don't know if it was the year that you were at CMK, but we had a guest speaker who nearly ruined CMK forever. Mm. They not only went an hour long, but then when they were done, someone said, um, can we, can we use the projector? I said, Oh, sure. Of course. And then they sat down for another longer lecture. Hey, um, yeah. And um, that's, you know, that's I, I literally <laughs> never spoke to the person again. I never spoke to the person again. Right. Um, right. And it, it changed it re really, it really did irre nearly irreparable harm to the experience of, spend time with someone, get inspired and then go back to your work. Um, right. When it's, you know, there's a lot of people who are just quite happy to sit in a chair and listen. Um, but that's yeah. not, that's why we don't use the word conference. Um, it's not a conference. It's an institute. It's a workshop. It's, it's somewhere where learning is active. And yeah. so having, having faculty who I can rely on to like, you know, literally with a gesture to know exactly what to do and no more is, is, is quite rewarding as well. For sure. I, I love too that because you do make people accountable because they have to attach themselves to a project. And I think the reflection that happens at the end of each day, because then you're, you're, you're asked, you know, how did it go today? What, what, what went on? What happened when you hit a wall? How did you overcome, you know, the challenges that you were facing? So it really does make you a part of 
it all just through the structure of how you've set it up, which. Right. Um, right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, flexibility and undesigned that's by design. I mean, even from yeah. the, you know, make a friend go to lunch, you know, come back when you're done right. Um, right. Is, is a piece of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, even, ref- you know, we try to be non-coercive. So, you know, reflection is, is voluntary. Um, you know, there are schools that use reflection just as a form of test. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think reflection is a particularly valuable um, pursuit for kids. Um, I, I, I don't think they're particularly reflective. I think that you, they, could, they could have used that time more productively on making their, their project better um, or asking a deeper question or testing a larger hypothesis. Um, and oftentimes a teacher can learn as much as they need to by sitting next to a kid or chatting with them mm-hmm. as they head out the door. Um, as opposed to let's sit in a circle and reflect. And then that gets with it all the trappings of, you know, writing things down and organizers and all this stuff that I couldn't care less about. And even, yeah. even there, I mean, we, we know which, we know which members of our team are better at leading those reflection circles. You know, when Dan and Molly were part of the Institute, they're like the yo-yo ma of that. I, it, it's <laughs> breathtaking. I can't even, I can't even, I can't even describe how good they are at it. I, I don't understand it. I will never understand it. Um, I don't. I don't lead those discussions because it's it's kind of heavy handed. If I'm there just by my personality, and people want to suck up to me because it's my event, or I I don't cloud my. I don't get involved in the reflections in that way. Um, mm-hmm. We've had we've had colleagues who are like the, the loveliest people. But if you put them in charge of a reflection circle, people just complain about stuff. Hmm. And yeah. it's like, well, well, that's yeah. weird. How'd that happen? And so, like, okay, yeah. you're not doing that anymore. Um, <laughs> so, so there's this, there's kind of a, there's an X factor to leading that, which is also probably another reason why we shouldn't make every teacher do it every right, right. Thursday or every third day or every <laughs> second period, or right? That yeah. that it's not just let's just sit in a circle and stare at each other. And I mean, I had this experience when. When I worked with Seymour Papper on my, my doctoral research, we created a high-tech, multi-age alternative learning environment inside a prison for teenagers. And I remember it was the end of 99. And we, so we were going into the new millennium and everybody was talking about the future and the past. And, and we put these kids in a circle and we had all the junk food we could carry in the middle of the, the circle and soda and all kinds of treats for the kids. And we were going to have a discussion about you know, the most important invention of the last century. And, um, and it was Seymour Papert and myself and David Cavallo, who was a faculty member at the MIT Media Lab, an interesting guy. And, and I remember the kids were just getting up and leaving the conversation and going back to working on their projects. And hmm. I remember thinking how funny it was that like people <laughs> probably would have paid money to, to witness this conversation. <laughs> um, but for most of the kids, I mean, they just had other work to do. And why were we bugging them with this nonsense? Um, yeah. and, and it was kind of like, get over yourself. It was just fine. They could like walk away from it and go back to working on something else. Um, yeah. you know, and left the three adults to have the conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was, can see that too. in in, in the things that you do that, and, and I feel it too, that students really are at the heart of, and they, you just learn so much from them. I mean, they just, um, they have less luggage and they just you know they love when they're inspired by something and they're into it just let me do it (laughs) like stop interrupting me Um, yeah i mean if 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 if, 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 yeah if i have a superpower my teaching superpowers is a whole bunch of stuff i don't care about Hmm. that Hmm. a lot of other people take really seriously and and, you know Hmm. so at cmk you know we go through this ritual of project planning and then we ask people to bunch up and then you know we we take the temperature and we you know if someone is doesn't look like they're participating, we, we try to find out what's going on or we invite them to join another group. Or, you know, one year mm-hmm. we had a guy who like basically went to a blackboard with a pointer and was lecturing his team and <laughs> everyone was too polite to leave. And we were trying to bust it up. And, you know, the second morning, I just, I just said, you know, I just got off the phone with the Pope. He said, I can annul any group that's not working. You're under no <laughs> obligation to stay with anybody. Um, but we've also had teachers yeah. who have said to us, Hey, you know, um, I'm just kind of watching. I'm just kind of lurking. I needed the headspace. I need to see what this looks like. I needed to get away from the stress of, of the and craziness of my school. And 
this is the this is the perfect experience and so okay cool yeah. we're good we won't bug you again um yeah. <laughs> you know there, there's no kind of time on task you know right. concerns um and and that's and again that's kind of the ethos of open education movement in the 60s and a Reggio Emilia approach and um, that when you create the a productive context for learning the the natural default will be learning yeah well said well said well Gary I want to thank you um, for coming and just spending a bit of time um, I do recommend anybody out there that's uh, listening, CMK Constructing Modern Knowledge, July 11th to 14th this year, right, Gary? Yes, and we have a pre-institute workshop on the 10th on um, play, the, the intersection of play and digital technology and learning led by two colleagues from the Fondation Reggio Emilia in Reggio Emilia. Oh, wow. This workshop won't be offered anywhere else. Um, so mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of a bonus, but yeah, July 11th to 14th, just go to constructingmodernknowledge.com. Mm-hmm.